Ja, solange wir noch kurz warten auf äh, die, das Ende des akademischen Viertels, <lacht> möchte ich die Zeit kurz nutzen. Ich stelle die Gäste noch nicht vor. Wir haben ein bisschen Spannung. Aber wir hatten ja geschrieben, es ist schon Einlass ab 18 Uhr. <lacht> Und der Hintergrund war, dass wir Gelegenheit geben wollten, die Ergebnisse des nachmittäglichen Workshops zu zeigen und für Sie diese zu sehen. Und ich werde jetzt einfach die verbleibenden acht Minuten da kurz ähm, dazu nutzen, das ist sozusagen jetzt geschenkte Zeit und ähm, sage da kurz etwas dazu. Mein Name ist Robert Huber, ich darf hier das neu entstandene Bauhaus Reuse auf dem Ernst-Reuter-Platz leiten, zusammen mit meinem Kollegen Peter Winter, den Sie gerade nicht sehen können, der, wie er heute schon sagte, viel hinter den Kulissen organisiert, ist auch wichtig. Und für unsere Gäste, aus, for our guests from Poland and from Estonia, you have simultaneous translation available over there. You just need to get the radios and the phones at the desk of the sound engineer, also for, you better take one, I mean, than you have, and that's not, because we actually thank the Goethe Institute for providing that. Which brings me to the fact that uh, we had a transnational workshop taking place uh, this afternoon. The context in which this happening uh, takes place today is uh, in the context of uh, Re-Bauhaus um, going back to a project by the Goethe Institute of 1970. From all the institutes in the Middle and Eastern European countries, uh, by each uh, Goethe Institute, uh, representatives were picked from the scene in uh, the cultural landscape uh, in uh, August uh, 2017. The idea behind it being that one wanted to learn in uh, on the evening of the anniversary of the 100 years of Bauhaus. One wanted to take a panoramic who what is going on. The idea was to create a festival on various sites spread out throughout one year so that in each of these countries could take place something from the proper context of Middle and Eastern Europe. Funded by the Goethe Institute, by the German Czech Future Fund, uh, the Federal Institute for Political Education, with the support of the Federal Foundation for uh, Architectural Culture in Berlin, Ostrava and Prague, in the, at the National Gallery of Prague, Helena Dodova, the head of the architectural collection of the National Gallery, took on this task and uh, took it over from the stakeholders. This is the last uh, exercise of the series uh, that uh, has taken place or is still taking place in Berlin, Ostrava and uh, Prague. And the idea is uh, what remains and uh, we have started a re-Bauhaus manifesto. You can read it here on these tables or screens, you may wonder, well, these are screens. We tried to get it done in a paperless way. If uh, we print the uh, tables for every of these uh, workshops, we would need so much materials. Doing this in a digital way, we can draw on our archived collections. This is the second preview on the Triennale of the Modern, uh, we showed also an exhibition on the development or the dynamics of the Ernst Reuter Platz. Uh, so people who drop by, it will be possible to take a look at what has been going on, that is going on in this archive. In the remaining four minutes, may I now say a few words? Well, the idea is uh, 
that uh, there will not be a ready-made manifesto as the outcome. What is to become a, a manifesto is the manifestation of the ongoing dialogue. That's why we succeeded after these two years to bring together almost the very same table of panelists. Uh, we wanted to ask you what has been going on in the meantime. What have you done so far in between uh, within the year 2019? What's your perception of the anniversary year? Also with a look at Germany. Then of the cover, Mr. Bodenschatz dropped by, who we have invited for the next week. He also dropped by, and he also participated in the discussion. It was quite interesting. We collected some uh, concepts, and the idea is the following. This uh, manifesto should be rather a dictionary. We collected terms and concepts that were relevant to us. We see ideology, and of course, uh, manifesto or re-Bauhaus or emancipation. This was an utterly important term. On the left column, we have compiled a sort of dictionary, a glossary. Everybody who has taken part here as a speaker or also as a participant, we will ask everyone to write down a short uh, Glossary termination. On the right half, you will see a running stream. You can post your texts. You can also publish social media contribution. You can write down your ideas. Every time I see one of those terms in the left column, when you claim that this has been important in the development of modernity in Central Europe, Every time you click on it, you can leave your mark. You see how often it appears. How often does it appear? So if you click on ideology or on the left, uh, on, if you click on the term emancipation, you will see on the right uh, pillar or on the right half uh, the frequency of this term. So. We think this is a very up-to-date manifesto. We have uh, various terms placed next to each other. They enter into a dialogue. We can allocate them to what has been said, written or posted. We hope this network uh, that, uh, of course, uh, shall not fall apart with the end of this project. So we hope to keep it alive and to continue communication. So that's what we did uh, this afternoon. Let me welcome and thank all the participants that have been with us. Maid, Camilla, Mattea, Helena, Josef. I'm sorry, uh, with the second names. I have always problems with family names. I'm so happy that we have become so well acquainted with each other. But uh, the full names can be read on our website. These are wonderful colleagues, I hope that you will also contribute to the discussion in English, if you wish to do so. So, now it's uh, 7.15. So, let's now start. Uh, I'm going to hand out the microphones, uh, one to Helena, Mr. Nagel, I am also pleased to hand over one to you. So, once again, a cordial welcome to Bauhaus Reuse on the Anstreiter Square. We are happy that we can organize uh, the last of the three events today. We started out here in Berlin with emancipation, about uh, modern emancipation. Then we talked about functionalism. And now we are going to talk tonight about the topic Constitution, Democracy and Architectural Culture. Let me present myself. My name is Robert Huber of Zukunftsgeräusche, Future Noises and or Bauhaus Reuse. And uh, I will hand over the microphone to Helena Daudova, my colleague that I quickly presented. She is going to welcome all the guests with a short biography. 
For all those who have never come here, very briefly, a quick word on this venue. Bauhaus reuse. Well, it has been called uh, this name because uh, you see around yourself the northern facade of the Bauhaus Dessau building. You look out of the authentic uh, window panes of the vocational school. You had a look at the city of Dessau. These window panes uh, do not go back to 1926, but 1976. There was already an anniversary taking place, 50 years of Bauhaus Dessau. It was celebrated and was used uh, in the former GDR to refurbish and renovate the Bauhaus. It looked rather modest. Uh, destruction caused by the war had been tapped over only provisionally. The, some uh, empty spaces uh, were um, covered with walls. Uh, these are the former balcony doors and the, the two facades uh, were refurbished. And Philip Oswald, the then director of the Bauhaus uh, archive, handed this over together with Bauhaus IKEA. This uh, structure was built up by trainees of the Knobelsdorf Schule which is uh, the second aspect why we have this reuse of Bauhaus in a positive sense of the Bauhaus idea. Education and um, craftsmanship, craftsmanship brought together with academia. For example, this evening, this is one of the topics. In 2018, the building was closed at the Bauhaus Archiv due to the, reconstru uh, the new building of the Bauhaus Museum that was f completed on time in 2019, which is not true. The construction is going on. But we finished on time with the reconstruction on the Anstreuter Square. Well, the, the year is not over yet, uh, but uh, Mr. Schroofenegg, intervened thanks uh, to the district of Charlottenburg Wilmersdorf and thanks to the uh, uh, district councillor Ernst Schroofenegger. Thank you for giving us uh, this permission to have for four years a center for transdisciplinary education and research and also civil participation. The nice thing about it is we have a reuse of the reuse. We have so many reuse projects where reuse ends where it would have ended anyway. In the sink we have a use reuse and we have also made it to build it up with trainees of the building faculty because this is an educational venue. At times it goes forward very slowly especially when it is very hot or when it is uh, very co cold, when it's very humid. When the weather is fine then, and the sun is shining, well, other things may be more important. Well, well these trainees are quite uh, competent people, young boys and girls uh, from seven different crafts. We had a delay in the commencement by seven months because we started the place uh, we are now on in very thoroughly, and also the competent authorities. And as a matter of fact, the trainees uh, change. So you start uh, from beginning every time uh, from scratch, uh, which slows down the whole process. On the other hand, it allows you to bring in new trainees into this educational context. While we are building, so many things are happening. From May onwards, we started our discussions and public events, and we need to arrange this. We have gone down for the, f the road further. We think by uh, the end of uh, next year, everything will be ready. So much on, by way of introduction, as I mentioned, Oliver Schroofenegger, I would like to present him. Mr. Schroofenegger is District Councillor for Building and Environment. I may present you and then I will go through the table. My colleague had those CV data, they are very well hidden. I don't know so much about you, Mr. Schroofenegger, you come from the Green Party. We are committed in a 
content-oriented manner to this project, I can only extend from the bottom of my heart a uh, thank you. We also took up the idea of an urban laboratory in 2050. Uh, what will be the appearance of the city in 30 years' time. Anstrotterplatz is a very symbolic and emblematic place. You need to try to... This urban laboratory is exactly the thing that needs to happen. So, from the bottom of my heart, once again, thank you so much. Uh, at the end of the series of events, I am very happy that you found time to discuss with us. Yeah, thank you very much. I would also like to thank you. My name is Lana Dorova. I am the curator of the National Gallery in Prague, the architectural collection where this year we organized two symposiums with the support of the German Czech Future Fund. One was on Bauhaus and functionalism and the other was on women and emancipation. We had Mary Pachinski, Professor Mary Pachinski, we invited her and she gave a great presentation and provided great support. What was important for this Rebauhaus Festival was to take and focus on the territory that is Eastern Europe. And I would like to quote Milan Kundera of the essay, this, The Tragedy of Central Europe. And let me quote, I wrote it into the manifesto here in English. So we now have this new historical situation 30 years after the fall of the wall. And I think that there are no geographies west and east anymore. They existed for 40 years, but now for 30 years, we have seen and had a European dimension that was strengthened by the accession of Central and Eastern European countries into the EU in 2004. So it was important for us to consider the new territorial dimension. And this was one of the reasons why we organized this festival. And the networks that existed between the World War, there existed very intensive networks, Bauhaus, etc. And we wanted to also shed some light on those and link ourselves to those. And we wanted to also invite curators and young experts from these countries to ha have a discussion with German colleagues. We wanted to link people and topics. And we wanted to make sure that everybody gets to know each other. So again, thank you so much to the Goethe Institute, to the German Czech Future Fund, and to the B Berlin, oh sorry, th the Federal Agency for Civic Education. They all facilitated this exchange. And now I have the honor to introduce our guests here tonight, our panelists. They will speak about constitution and building culture. So first of all, we have Christina Etmeyer, the president of the Chamber of Architects. Brief CV, she studied in Berlin at the UDK. She studied here and since 1992, she has been running her own architectural and urban planning office here in Berlin. So you are sort of a pioneer that fits perfectly into this pattern. Since 1992 until 97, she had different jobs at TU Berlin, at the Arts College in Weissensee, and since 2009, she has been the vice president, and since 2013, she has been the president of the Chamber of Architects in Berlin. So a cordial welcome to you. And then Miss Petra Ernstberger. I think 
I briefly met you in Leipzig at the book fair, and I think we briefly discussed our agenda. Currently, you are the managing director of the German Czech Future Fund. Since 1990, you have been a member of the Social Democratic Party in Germany, and from 1992 until 2005, you were chairwoman of the SPD subdistrict Hochwohnsiedel. I think that is in Bavaria very difficult for me to pronounce. From 1994 until 2017, you were a member of the German parliament for the SPD, for the Social Democratic Party. And since November 2004, you were parliamentary managing director of the SPD parliamentary group. And for 12 years, you chaired the German Czech parliamentarian group in the German parliament. Oh, 20 years. Okay, sorry for that. And now you are the managing director of the German Czech Future Fund. And then we have Mr. Bernd Hunger. director of the Competence Center for Large Settlements. He is an urban planner and a city sociologist and lives in Berlin. He studied in Weimar at the only school of architecture in the former GDR. This is where you studied, okay, correct. It was not the only one, okay, but the most important one because there was no technical university in the GDR, was there? No, it didn't exist in Weimar the most significant university existed. Okay, and in Weissensee, all right. Since 1987 until 1990, Bernd Hunger chaired the department at the Institute of Urban Planning at the Construction Academy of the GDR. From 91 until 2007, he was the chair and owner of the city office Hunger city research and urban development and since 1999 he has been the spokesperson for urban planning research and development with the gdw that is the association of german housing companies so in other words mr hunger deals mostly with big settlements and with city sociology and urban planning and last but not least Last but not least, we would like to welcome a very important guest, Mr. Rainer Nagel. He is the chair of the Federal Foundation for Building Culture. After studying ar architecture in Hanover and after working in Hamburg, he had different functions at district and senate levels in Hamburg. And since 1998, he worked at as a managing director of Hafen City Hamburg. From 2005 on, he was the chair in the urban department in Berlin. He was in charge of urban planning and the planning of free spaces. Rainer Nagel is a member of the German Academy for City Planning and Regional Planning and also a member of the Association of German Architects. He is also a member in the Board of National Urban Development and the EBA Expert Advisory Council. Since 2009, he has been teaching, amongst others, at the Technical University of Berlin. Welcome. The Federal Foundation of Building Culture, did you say that? Yeah, I said this in the very beginning. It was so many things, sorry. All right. That is all really fantastic. So I have to make one more important remark. Because of the EU GDIP, we are pointing out that we are going to audio record and videotape this event here tonight. If you don't want to be in pictures, if you don't want to be filmed, please raise your hands. And then we will give you a paper bag. So you can hide behind a paper bag then. You will be pixelated, in other words. Okay, obviously everybody has given their consent. Thank you very much for that. But it's important to mention privacy issues. Could be that somebody doesn't want this. By the way, this also applies to the panelists. So you are also giving your consent. Thank you very much. 
we had this already afterwards. Somebody said, I want to be cut out, but he was sitting right in the middle of the panel. That was an issue. So we had to organize a split screen projection, which was a big problem. I'm not kidding. Okay, now let me start again. Let us introduce the topic and let me quote on what we said. Constitution, Democracy and Building Culture is the title of our event. Constitution 2, because we had Constitution 1, and Constitution 1 happened in Ostrava in May. In May, we also wanted to organize the second event, so we had this ping pong, we wanted to organize it here in Berlin, but for personal reasons it didn't work out. But it would have been the 17th anniversary of the German Basic Law, which would have been a great date. I don't know what happened on the 26th of November, probably also many, many historical events, but it is not enough to celebrate an anniversary. So 100 years of Bauhaus is what we are celebrating. And we are looking at the last 100 years, what else happened 100 years ago, 100 years of Weimar Constitution. We are not going to tell you any theoretical things. We had it in Ostrava. 100 years century full of questions. The Weimar Constitution was the title. We had a former presidential candidate of Slovakia and a constitutional judge, a co-founder of the Czech Constitution there at this event. No, tonight we would like to focus on democracy and building culture. And, yeah, 100 years of Bauhaus, question mark. 100 years of Weimar Constitution, 100 years of the development of modernity and democracy in Europe on the challenges regarding building culture. 20, sorry, 2019 marks the 100th anniversary of the Weimar Constitution and therefore in 2019 we have various anniversaries that are being celebrated in Europe. The foundation of the Slovak Republic for instance and societal emancipation in Europe developed a development of modernity which at the time encompassed modern constitution and facilitated different building cultures. 100 years later central issues on housing, city, public spaces or gender equality are still hotly debated. And the Constitution at the time, and we discussed this also at the Conference of the Competence Center, where Mr. Nagel and Ms. Talgott, who apologizes, she couldn't come today. There was a confusion regards the dates. And paragraph 155 of the Weimar Constitution was illustrated at this conference. So this is like a comment on a past time. Today, democracy is questioned by radical right-wing parties. The democratic guiding principles and architecture of modernity created identification with a socially just society and built environment. In contrast, we are now asking ourselves what meaning and significance does building culture have and should have at the end of the day with regards to a political and democratic responsibility of building culture. We recently discussed this in the context of the architectural dispute, but this should not just result in a debate on right rooms or right-wing spaces. No, it is a controversy on aesthetics. It's about a holistic discourse. It is about the political position of building culture of foundations of countries in middle Europe, the Weimar Constitution and the civilatory decline that we saw here in Germany with Nazi Germany. And then we have the post-war period including the debates in the East and the West. We also had the Bauhaus debate. And we see implications until today for a modern, emancipated and democratic society. So, that was the initial hypothesis. And to my right, I would now like to start the chairman of the Federal Foundation for Building Culture. What political position does building culture have for democracy? I think it has a great value. When you walk around, you will notice that it is not 
determined by aesthetics or by the culture of building, but we will soon reach also considerations of soci sociology and also constitutional theory and also the free them to assemble, you hear the tractors uh, humming around, so it's not just aesthetics and historical buildings. I think uh, the concept of democratic space is extremely important. Uh, in other words, without a sufficient offering in terms of building, no democracy can thrive. Coming back to the anniversary of the Bauhaus, uh, we have uh, this uh, final event, Bauhaus reuse or reuse Bauhaus, Bauhaus reuse. It's almost the conclusive event of the uh, Bauhaus anniversary. 100 years of Bauhaus. I don't know what's your judgment on this one release. Who believes it's a smash hit, a full success? Nobody showing up. One, one positive vote. So when uh, the urban planning who thinks uh, that the year of cultural heritage in Europe it was a full success. Own, to my surprise, only four people showed up. So these anniversaries pass by and you get over them. Uh, the Bauhaus anniversary started out uh, rather slowly because uh, at the very beginning people started saying so much Bauhaus we organized five events among other things with the trade union uh, with the trades and uh, and crafts uh, we also erected a sculpture as a first movement we thought it was a highly relevant topic on the other hand on this occasion the 100 years of uh, Weimar Constitution was short thrifted, but in reality, Bauhaus would never have been established if not probably at the same time, around the same time, the Weimar Constitution would had had not been adopted. They wouldn't have the grounds and the organizational structures. Uh, this uh, feeling of a new start wouldn't uh, have been there. It was fully supported by politics, especially the left wing. Currents, uh, but also the social democrats. It was rather viewed uh, with a critical eye by the conservative and right wing circles. So, without this support, the Bauhaus would not have thrived. What's true to the present day? The building culture, we hope that uh, they provide us with the solution of social questions, like in 1918, 1919, it's the topic of housing, as a true shortage of housing, and the social democrats hope to resolve the question of housing from the Bauhaus, which provided us with the main support, it was not so much art or handicraft or uh, trades, uh, but when the Bauhaus started out in 1927 uh, for, sh for earnest with uh, modern social building. Then there was a big upswing. It was not the Bauhaus people, but their fans and their network started building in Frankfurt, in Stuttgart, in Darmstadt. Mm. Huge uh, residential neighborhoods, uh, settlements that became a role model and the Bauhaus made itself felt the reduction of uh, price-worthy building. Uh, there, uh, we have analogies. We do not have anything like a Bauhaus, but we have intermittent status. Let's see, Ed Meyer Berlin is uh, preparing for the next EBA. So the exceptional period, uh, intermittent uh, exceptional phase would probably be also a reflection of the Bauhaus atmosphere. Again, considerations are being undertaken how one can build at the low cost uh, with cheap uh, building materials for example wood and also for the sake of climate protection well uh, we must admit uh, that uh, these um, supposedly cheap uh, building materials are much more expensive than the traditional building materials. Uh, the same was true for uh, the uh, older Bauhaus. Uh, so the new building techniques turned out to be more expensive than the traditional or the standard building practice. And Gropius lost uh, any mood to continue on that road. So we have so many analogies. It's extremely political, the dilemma today, 
like back then, we know, 100 years afterwards, we knew what we had got with the Bauhaus. Today, again, politics uh, does not perceive the opportunities in building culture. So many different issues are taken as uh, a triggering moment f to legitimize oneself, immigration, climate issues, uh, and a maximum limit on the rents. So it's much ado about nothing. But the opportunities this, that rest within the building sector are hardly ever seen. So we need to take this responsibility, taking the politicians. Why don't you take advantage of us and of the enormous potential that rests in building and in building culture? You have also a holistic view. Holistic, well, even more than what we call holistic or sustainable, not eco only ecological and economical, but also a spatial impact, creating on, on also in a procedural way, because Bauhaus was also a pro procedural experiment in a cultural sense. Before following up on this political sphere, a quick follow-up question. There were so many starting points for every of our guests. The question of housing, the Bauhaus could not really r have a home run. And what I heard from you when it was about the settlements of the post-war modernity and also those settlements before modernity, building culture needs uh, support from the politicians and it needs to be seen in a, ho in a holistic way. I think this is also close to your heart, Mr. Schroffenegger. Such a municipal approach. Uh, in order not to compartmentalize uh, urban planning and urban building, and also your topic, uh, Miss Ernst Berger, Chamber of Architects, uh, so much Bauhaus, it's not so much Bauhaus. On the contrary, in the Czech Republic, we have so much of functionalism. Nonetheless, the functionalism was short drifted. Uh, that's also a reason why you supported this Czech perspective. What can you tell us about uh, your feelings uh, when you have this perspective on Germany from the Czech Republic, seeing the Bauhaus in context? Well, of course, uh, we must say, there must, uh, th uh, p certain political conditions were necessary to have such a thriving building culture, not only the Bauhaus label, but throughout Central Europe it was a major foundation for the dynamics and identification with modernity. What's your judgment? Seeing this uh, from a frequent traveler between Germany and the Czech Republic, what's your view on this anniversary? What's your view on this uh, series of events uh, that has not been appreciated enough in the making of the modern states in Central and Eastern Europe. Well, as state was stated before, well, there were certain conditions under which the Bauhaus could come into being in the first place. The Weimar Constitution is a part of it, but also the right to vote for the women, but also the development in social housing. Social housing was uh, taken as a major task. Uh, something had to be done for the workers. That was a, an environment in which uh, the Bauhaus could create open spaces, open spaces to think it through thoroughly, to experiment, and also to Open spaces were disputed. That's something that I want to see again. So many things that were triggered by the Bauhaus have not been completed to the present day. We have not reached a status that was uh, really envisaged back then, looking at the equality of genders. Well, we still have not reached the stage uh, where women have the same income as men, both in Czech Republic and in Germany. Nor have we reached uh, the same ranking of uh, women in top uh, leading positions, uh, let alone the universities, where we have still a male dominance. The same is true 
for example, what is the buzzword? Well, we have the chaos in housing because uh, politics in certain periods, especially in social housing, has uh, cut down. And uh, the, uh, the social situation in Germany has improved uh, very much. So we do not need any longer social housing, but look into the major cities. The rents have been pushed up to such a degree that ordinary people can no longer afford the rent and couples have to work uh, both to afford a decent living space in, in Munich and in Prague. We have exponential growth of rents. Uh, then you have institutions like Airbnb that are aiming only at profit and that just trade of these apartments. Uh, I don't see any major counteraction in Prague that they would uh, be limited. So the uh, Airbnb and its companies like this. So the lack of housing is not tackled. We have also differences in the development of rural areas uh, and the cities. I come from a uh, rural environment. I'm not a city dweller. Up to certain some years ago, you could buy a house for just one euro. They were thrown after any interested people certain structures, such as uh, small uh, villages, are depopulated. Uh, so the s inner cities of the s large, uh, smaller cities are bleeding out down to the last pub. So they are undergoing a process of uh, depopulation. A new culture of building needs to rethink these developments in practical terms. An example, in my region, together with a uh, female friend, I wanted to set up a community apartment. We were looking for an apartment, but you cannot live in such a living community like with uh, parents uh, and children. You need your own retreats. So the whole object must be bigger. You need to have uh, the rooms. There must be a different layout. No chance. What about? Well, of course, yeah. Now, finally, we ended up building a house and we refurbished and renovated it from scratch. It's 120 years old, but not everybody can afford this. So it's a structure that probably will also affect, uh, will also be desired by the elderly more often than in the past. They want to live in communities. Well, the other is there are our patchwork families. Again, for these uh, patchwork families, we do not have suitable living spaces or apartments or where it is possible to live together as a patchwork family. So I think these are things uh, that politics... Well, I have been in politics for 22 years. Politics uh, did not have it on the screen well with a rent stop or rent limit, uh, an attempt has been made, but it does not work perfectly. We need so much uh, free space to consider all the future designs of our living situation, to discuss it, and also to have a dispute, because dispute was also something that was exercised by the Bauhaus. Well, yeah, there was some political explosive power. I agree. So we had Mr. Bodenschatz here, and he said that there is a printed matter of the German parliament on the Bauhaus here. And he said, yes, that it was about the Bauhaus of, of the export champions. This is an export product of Germany, and it should circulate the world. We read this. And I think he is totally right what we basically critically said. I would like to pass the question to Ms. Edmeyer. So these were building political issues that we have discussed so far. But in the Bauhaus year, like this anniversary year that Mr. Nagel sketched, like the typical 
anniversary pattern. Did we bark up the wrong tree? Would it have been an occasion to raise political issues and to connect it to the debate regarding Weimar and housing? These are fundamental and political issues. And it was sent out to the rest of the world, but maybe we forgot to focus on what is happening here and also in Central and Eastern European countries after the First World War. So why are we still confronted with all these issues and challenges? Are we too unpolitical? Did we miss discussions? Did we forget to have the right discussions? We invited actually a lawyer here, somebody specializing in constitutional law, but nobody had time. Do we need paragraph 155 again? Yeah, I printed it out here, but what I prepared, I definitely have to share with you. I'm sorry for that. So, but let me come back to your question. The Bauhaus year is not over yet. It was probably not a super success. Nobody would say it was 100% success, but the question is how do you measure this? And in or amongst experts, there was not a lot of new things produced. My generation s learned everything already during our studies. Not much new was produced. Maybe there was a more differentiated focus on women and Bauhaus. That was very important, although these were kitschy films or kitsch films, but the population and the viewers thought that these were a very interesting contribution to the debate. And then we have these three Bauhaus phases. In fact, it's actually two. They were considered very carefully and the Weimar Bauhaus phase did not really contribute much to housing. It only started in 1925. And in this context, if you of course consider current housing issues and problems, and then believe that Bauhaus will provide you respect uh, with the respective answers, then you might be disappointed. Firstly, the Bauhaus did not really focus a lot on housing as such. Secondly, answers that were found and given at the time might not be topical anymore. We have to be very honest here. So this whole mood of changing things, of starting, and now I would like to quote somebody because between the Weimar Constitution and the basic law there are many similarities, especially when it comes to ownership, expropriation issues. So we do see some similarities, Yes, yet there's one big difference. In Article 155 of the Weimar Constitution, it says that housing needs have to be fulfilled by the state. And every German is entitled to a healthy housing. And families who have multiple kids should be provided with reasonable home. And this is what the Weimar Constitution actually says. It doesn't only say that ownership obliges, but that the processing and utilization of soil is an obligation. So the increase in the value of soil, which incurs over time, has to be made public, uh, sorry, available to the public. I mean, not everything was put into practice to 100%, but at least the Constitution stipulated this. And this is a big difference to the basic law. The German basic law just says that housing or the flat should be inviolable. So in other words, you should be left alone in your home. It also, it's also said in the Weimar Constitution, yeah, it's also said there, but the basic law is very limited and it's just this one sentence on housing in the basic law. Housing during the Weimar Republic, which is not necessarily identical with Bauhaus, of course there are connections and links, but uh, this is why I actually like the title here today, because 100 years of Weimar Constitution in the context of housing is at least as important as the Bauhaus itself. 
And maybe we really neglected this topic, especially in the context of the expropriation debate that we have and see here in Berlin in particular, but we might also see it at a national level very soon. And we do not have to install socialism again or sketch the scenario of or the threat scenario of socialism. No, the German law or constitution also stipulates for expropriation. The question is, when is it appropriate? And I'm sure there will be some hot debates on this. What is your opinion on this? When it is, is it appropriate? Well, it depends on the individual case, of course. I would say as long as we have phenomena like Airbnb and many other organizations, that can be actually handled with the respective laws, I don't think that we have enough tools and means at hand. I think we need to do more in order to come up with an appropriate housing policy. Well, we also have to see that during the Weimar Republic, that is after this first war, First World War, housing issues were much bigger than today. Consequently, new building and new buildings during the Weimar Republic satisfied a certain deficit, first and foremost. Yet it is fascinating to see how they talked about new buildings for the new human being, for the new woman, for new Frankfurt. Everything was new at the time. So they sort of pressed the reset button and they didn't want anything to look like in the past. And this is the aesthetics component that should not be over-evaluated. Because it was first and foremost a social engineering approach. So the architect was a social engineer. It was unfortunately only males at the time, but they were considered to be a social engineer that has the respective know-how in order to quickly and appropriately provide enough housing for people. Not social housing, mind you, that is a very dif important difference. It was not just about workers, it was about the public. It was about everybody. Everybody was looking for flats and homes. And housing was geared to basically everybody's needs. A lot of research has been done on what educational approaches they pursued at the time. So the image that architects and also policy makers had of how people are supposed to live was clearly determined and clearly answered. There were not many opportunities for people to develop it was first and foremost about a hygienic, functional home. And a very brief detour on the topic of women. Yeah, really very brief. The famous Frankfurt Kitchen did not serve the purpose of women being able to work. No, the purpose was to optimize certain routines so that women, mothers, wives would have more time for their kids and in order to, ca to ca take care of themselves. So that was the purpose of the Frankfurt Kitchen and it was not women's emancipation in the sense of that she would then have time to also work. So it was more about efficiently design household activities of women, yes. Now, we are focusing on the topic of housing, but there are also other topics that need to be discussed in the context of urban planning and architecture. These are also, there are also other important aspects of building culture that are linked to the freedoms and the constitutional rights of citizens. But as we are talking about housing now, and Bernd Hunger just said that he also would like to say something now, you as a housing and living expert. Now, if we had paragraph 155, for instance, also in our basic law today, 
Or let me put it differently, why don't we have such a paragraph in our basic law? Why didn't we copy it? And if we had such a paragraph, would our debate then be different regarding expropriation, regarding commons, regarding participation in these aspects, participation regarding soil prices and the negative consequences like speculation, etc. I am going to answer your question, yet I would like to start with the title, Constitution, Democracy and Building Culture. Congratulations. It is wonderful that we talk about the Weimar Republic. Finally, we discuss it. Because we often discuss housing very quickly then. Earlier on, I said that the Bauhaus year was a surefire success. Because we had broad groups, wide groups of the population discuss architecture. I come from a Thuringian village and my relatives now know what the Bauhaus is. That is already an achievement. And now I can also turn the entire story and ask myself, how come? Obviously, they found a topic that the entire population finds interesting. From the right to the very left, everybody likes Bauhaus. And finally, the population or the citizens agree. And I think this is one of the reasons for this hype. And this is in a very strange relationship to the low reflection or poor reflection of the Weimar Republic's constitution. I mean, it also comes from Weimar. And that is a finding which as such needs to be considered. Other democracies celebrate their democratic holidays totally differently. And I think this is a serious thing that needs to be considered. And here, I was sitting already in these buildings here before because I studied in Weimar at the Bauhaus and I was a contemporary witness of the reopening in 1986 behind the glasses because the Weimar architectural theory m contributed to the reopening of the Bauhaus. When thinking of my studies, when thinking of the Bauhaus in Weimar, we were uh, between Jugendstil, Goethe's garden house, also an enlightenment project, and then three minutes later, House an Horn, Cosiness style. And interestingly enough, we, during the DDR, did not talk much about the Weimar Republic. It was a capitalist form of government, social democratic. So I think we really have to catch up and we do have to talk about our democratic roots. So it is great that you are organizing this event here. Now let me come back to your question. The Weimar Republic was an enabler of new building with its emancipatory manifestations and ideas. Building for broad masses, light, air and sun. Everything that is criticized nowadays was wanted at the time. People, or sorry, buildings were supposed to look exactly the same. The front facade should look exactly like the back facade. People were supposed to walk around the building. They hated plots. And I think this is a huge project that has directly to do with the Weimar Republic. And this automatically brings up the soil question, the expropriation question that was part and parcel of this. But the Weimar Republic embarked upon a different economic path. They did not take the top-down approach, expropriated everything like during communism or in the Soviet Union. No, they invented a house interest rate. So basically they laid the foundation for the social market economy. House interest rate is a fascinating idea. After the inflation everybody lost their money but one social group gained, i.e. those who had real estate and now they had to pay because of this new tax. So 20,000 flats in Berlin were built at the, con at the consequence. Huge achievement. And what you also can learn from the Weimar Republic is that market forces cannot be eliminated when it comes to housing. And what is being done at the moment, expropriation in a historic second, where in five, six major cities in Germany, for the first time, we have a scarcity of homes and flats. I don't know whether this is the right approach because it's pretty radical. 
what other approaches do something against speculators against the speculative approach but isn't that the overall target no the target of the rental cap is a very broad one and now everybody is affected but what could you do against speculators okay now i mean this would be way too comprehensive and a totally different debate there are many many different instruments that could be used but strangely enough they are not used I don't really want to focus on this because I find another topic much more interesting. Democracy, building, Bauhaus. And if we keep focusing on these topics, then we can really change something. It's more about the democratic constitution of the country and it should be celebrated even more. Not just in the aesthetics of building, where everybody praises each other. So I think this is important in general. So the question, the section of 155, the article 155 on building. Isn't that a topic that need, why wasn't it enshrined in the basic law, the constitution? Because after World War II, the housing situation was not very rosy indeed. Do you want, well, well, uh, property, uh, obliges uh, the article 50 is also enshrined for the purposes of the common good for example to alleviate the scarcity of housing uh, the appropriation uh, may take place uh, it must be compensated but it is enshrined in the German Constitution the basic law if you take a broader perspective it was a great idea to have uh, a market economy is still heavily regulated by social perspectives. What uh, the old Bundesrepublik achieved in the 50s and 60s was in unbelievable. There was uh, also a strong bond on the rent, but there was always a private interest to, uh, to build. Hardly any other country has a similar standard uh, as high as in Germany. Just a handful of some countries. I do not want to cover up the fact that we have serious problems on the Berlin housing market. But uh, right now, you are shooting with cannons at a petty problem. Well, it's not a petty problem for those who are looking for... A, we are not uh, talking in a populist context, but the discussions uh, that are being held uh, are going on. But... Uh, they are far above uh, the line, I would say. Um, Edward, uh, the appreciation of the soil uh, that uh, is uh, not uh, achieved by any personal effort needs to be brought to the avail. Well, we have so many instruments. We have the scrimming of uh, added value. It's a question of the political will. But you can always uh, deduct uh, the profit that is gained without any work. So it's an interesting statement. That would probably be one of the policies uh, that would not be an overall as you criticized.